Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Behind the Cape. I'm data superhero Keith Belanger, and I'm joined by fellow data superhero uh, Chris Hasty. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, so uh, yeah, great to have you. So today, you know, I guess you're going to come talk to us about uh, Snowpark for Python. Is that is that true? Can you give us a little bit of a overview of what that is? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Snowpark for Python, or Snowpark in general, was introduced uh, around the summit last year was when it was officially announced and became a, a big thing. Uh, Snowpark for Python specifically is effectively a, a layer on top of the old Python connector for Snowflake that allows you to do a whole new load of things. Uh, it allows you to create store procedures in Snowflake and use UDFs in Snowflake. Sorry, in Python. Obviously, it's all in Snowflake. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Python. Uh, it allows you to script whole Python processes that can interact back and forth with Snowflake to do all sorts of cool and fun things that just unlock a load more functionality than what Snowflake naturally had available. So it's really yeah. exciting. Yeah, no, that that is great because you're so used to in the past everything with databases, right? Everything had to be SQL, right? SQL, SQL. And now that people are getting more comfortable with other things, other languages like Python, obviously Python being very popular, being able to take that ability and now bring it to to the Snowflake platform. That's it's pretty exciting, especially for a lot of the data science types folks and, and the people that are are more familiar with that. You know, now you're able to bring that right down um, into into Snowflake itself. So so that is exciting. So yeah. So can you get it go a little bit more deeper into into it with us? Yeah, absolutely. So. What I'm going to do, actually, if it's okay, I'd like to dip into an example of something yep. that I put together using it. Um, so this is specifically... Do you want, uh, want me to share the screen? Uh, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's right. go for it. Let's share that. Let's, let's um, share that. All so right, we go. Office, I don't have any proper screenshots of things to share on this, um, purely because, you know, being consultants, being clients, a lot of what we do is for clients. So I don't have anything yet, but I am hoping to launch a, a blog about this with it all decrypted later. But what I can share is some code, some diagrams, and a, a general walkthrough of what it is. Um, and I, I think it's pretty cool. So the idea behind this is we were trying to find a better way to have accounts that were connecting to Snowflake for service processes. So things like, uh, well, this example is things running in Azure that are interacting with Snowflake um, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, we've got things like uh, simple things when data lands in a storage bucket, pick it up, transform it, maybe update some log tables and insert it into Snowflake and kind of bring it through. We've got some more complicated processes, um, which actually I'll talk again a little bit more later. But for example, dropping an Excel file into a bucket, having some Python to convert the Excel into CSV, and then ingest it into Snowflake and then take it from there to do some metadata driven ingestion pieces. Before we could do that, we had to figure out a way to connect uh, and a way to authenticate to Snowflake in a way that we trusted would be secure long term. And that's where this little diagram come in and this solution. So what we've built here is a process in Python that can run as part of an Azure or function. And it will generate a new authentication key pair within memory, within Python, like in the, the Azure function that's running. It will store the private key in an Azure Secrets vault, and it can deploy the public key out onto a Snowflake user. So the main reason we wanted to do it this way, we could go through and in fact, I have in the past created my private keys in Snowflake itself, um, usually by having some form of, at the time it was a JavaScript based store procedure that could create them. But it's not really best practice to create a private key in a different environment where it's going to be used. The whole point of the private key is meant to be private and it's never really meant to be shared or distributed. So what this allows you to do is directly create it where it's gonna be stored, which is in the secrets vault, and then use Snowpark to log into Snowflake as a security admin user or a user admin user or whichever role would be appropriate for you and update that user uh, or up update a given user 
with a new public key. And the real beauty of this is it, it can rotate the keys as well. So what we've done is we've set this up. It can run every, I think it runs every two months and it automatically goes through all of the service accounts that we know we have that match um, Azure functions and user secrets well. And it can go, okay, I'm just gonna loop through each one and I'm gonna generate a new key pair and I'm gonna deploy the new private key. I'm gonna rotate the old private key into the, the second slot, if you will. And we can just keep that going, which means that long term, our security is maintained without having to manually intervene and change things. Exactly, and I know a lot of the of uh, projects I've been on Snowflake, right, is you always have to worry about somebody did know what that secret, you know, um, password was, right? Because they would generate it, they would copy, and they would paste it in. And, you know, in what you're talking about here, you just take that whole human, um, no, somebody having to know what that possibly having that key is, um, you just kind of take it right out of the equation, right? And so now it's just all automated and system driven and and just brings that security. That, 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 this is really this is really interesting. Oh, that's like it. I was really proud of this one. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you're really showing that, you know, being able to code this in Python, right? And then and now bring that to this to the database platform is that perfect combination, right? Of the of the two solutions working working together. Yep. Excellent. Exactly. Um, so what what we've done, we started with this and then we actually we talked about it a little bit more and we thought, let's take it one step further. And I went as far as making this next diagram. Um, this one is very similar in terms of the underlying functionality, the, the intent. But what this one does is it's specifically for a single user, an actual real life human user as opposed to a service account. Okay. And this function runs as an external function through Snowflake. Yeah. So the idea, um, just to recap for external functions is within Snowflake, you can execute an Azure function or an AWS Lambda function from Snowflake. You can pass variables to it and you can retrieve information back. By putting appropriate layers of security onto that function in Snowflake. An easy example being, I'm Chris, I should be able to change the keys for Chris, but I should not be able to change the keys for Keith. Right. <laughs> um, but we've set that up. But then this external function means that any of our users at any point can just say, okay, call this procedure to generate myself a keeper. And this bounces back out to Azure. Again, in Azure, it generates the key and it can um, do all the same things it would do on the previous example. But this time, instead of storing the new private key in a secrets vault, it stores that private key in a blob store location that's okay. got a whole bunch of security on it. Um, and the thing that's shared back to the user is a pre-signed URL so that they can one off so that if once the url is used and the url stops working again the url is only active for i think it's an hour and they can use that to download their key oh nice and yeah. weirdly this has been used more <laughs> than the first process and i was really happy with the first process and this process i kind of built almost begrudgingly thinking well people can generate their own keys right now that it's not now, this is really, really interesting, you know, use of, I'll be the first to admit when I start thinking of like Python and code, you know, I'm thinking about data manipulation and, and data integration and stuff like that. But this, for me, this gives a whole different um, use case that I hadn't really thought of. And, and this is really interesting. So what other use cases do you have that you've been using um, the, the Snowfark Park for Python capabilities? So my other use case, which I... I'm particularly proud of and has been quite a while in the making is, uh, let me just swap my screen share over. Uh, this one green, and this is my, uh, here we go. So I've got a process, this is actually a, I'll flip through, there's a, there's a fair few different screenshots on here that I'm gonna, uh, go through in various degrees. Some of them I'm just going to skip over and pretend they don't exist because I don't want to 
kill everybody with diagrams, but the general process behind this is I wanted a way to ingest data into Snowflake without it having to necessarily have been a CSV or whatever in the first place, and without us knowing specifically what the data was, what shape it is. We just want something to be able to say, right, pick up the data, ingest it, and then maybe do some other cool things. And this this process is very much a, a procedure as opposed to a like a one-off function or anything like that. There's a whole load of different bells and whistles, and I'm not going to go right into the detail. But the core element of it, let me just find the main initial diagram. Here we go. Uh, wait, is that the main? Yes. The idea behind this is you provide two storage buckets. You can see in the top right corner here, uh, metadata and data storage buckets. And these will align in some way. Um, so the data could be a, a standard CSV file with 10 columns, let's say. The metadata would be a similar CSV file, but telling you what those 10 columns are, what their name is, what the data type is, you know, any uh, function, like just a load of metadata things around it. And what this process does is it starts by ingesting the metadata into a table. It then goes through what is in that metadata to, uh, I just called it in this diagram, apply it in Snowflake. And when I say apply, I mean, figure out if the table already exists in the right yeah. location. If it doesn't, create it. If it does, check the columns that are there. If any columns are missing, add those new columns and effectively make sure everything is there already for ingestion. And then the next stage can actually ingest the data into that newly created table and then do a bunch of extra fun things that we'll talk about in a minute. This previously was kind of possible before Snowpark came along. You could have done a load of JavaScript store procedures to try and figure out the way and go back and forth. But it wasn't really possible until we had Python in the picture because of the amount that we want to interact effectively outside of the right. Snowflake world. Right. I, I've seen similar things being done, but to your point, being done with external solutions, right? I'm going to have to write a, 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 something on the outside of Snowflake to interact with Snowflake, where now in this scenario, you're actually having the ingestion being done by Snowflake itself, rather than ingesting it and pushing it to Snowflake. Exactly. And the nicest part of this is that we can leverage other Python functionality to improve it and right. to, to stretch further. Um, and that's going to lead me to, uh, effectively, there's, there's a before and after, if you will. This main bit in the middle gets data in, but each of these boxes is a wider function. I'm not going to go right into detail on them. What I am going to do is flick over to the ingest data one, um, which, uh, well, actually, specifically, here we go. Uh, I will zoom in a bit. Let's go. Uh, we're not as fast about the top. Oh, sorry, that's metadata. I need data. Uh, there we go. Oh, good. This one actually fits in one thing. I'm not sure. What it is. <laughs> okay. So, not only do we ingest the data, which is in that first box, but after that, I've got some testing built in and um, what I've called a recreate prepared view. The idea behind the testing has three layers you can use. One of those layers is a simple thing. Um, you've told me that these columns are expected. These columns haven't been in the data. So I automatically say that this file is a rejection because it's missing those columns. Um, second test, a little bit more. It, are those fields the correct data types? The third area is the bit that I think is really fun, where I've got a load of bespoke tests built in, where you can say things like, for this file, this field should be of this format or should be in this range or pretty much anything you can think of which in SQL would equate to using where clauses or having clauses or qualify clauses. I've effectively converted that set into an input table and it can comb through that table, apply all those tests. If any of those tests fail, it can report them. If they fail for 
Well, if every record of a file fails, then the whole file gets rejected. If only some records fail, then there's like a custom built-in thing to, depending on the situation. It can reject the file or accept the file or a warning or whatever. But, yeah, so, so you're essentially able to do uh, ad hoc tests that are might be specific to that file that need to be done that you don't need for all the other files, but it is something that needs to be done for that file coming in um, purposes. Exactly. So it's a whole load of bespoke testing, um, which looks a little bit ugly in this diagram. I was pondering whether to share this diagram or not because <laughs> I managed to find a nice way to do it. Um, but as you what it is, it's a whole load of bespoke rule-based tests that get applied specifically for that thing. And then it determines based on that if the file is valid, which I thought is quite nice and it, it works quite well. You know, I think, and I think this is really, you know, this is really interesting use case for this because everybody, every organization, everybody who uses Snowflake, right? The first thing we got to do is get the data in, right? And, and, um, but everybody's doing essentially the same, the same thing. So solutions like this, where you can make those automated type of um, capabilities, you know, can really, you know, nobody wants to be spending all their time ingesting data into Snowflake, but it can become a time consuming if you don't have something like this. So I think this is a very good, you know, interesting uh, use case for, for using the, the Snowpark in, in Python. Yeah, the, the thing that really made it work, I think the thing that clicks in my mind for it, up, up to now, what I've talked about with this arguably could have been done in another tool. We could have used any of the transformation tools. I'm deliberately not naming names, but we could use any right. transformation right. tools out there or any of the other tools out there. And you can follow this general process. But where the Python comes in, and this is the nice part, is right on, this is the last diagram I'm going to be sharing. It's a big, ugly one. <laughs> but I'll only go into this middle part. Is when this process runs, and this is actually the, the main orchestrator that performs the entire thing where this is running in Azure for us. Um, we have 40, right now it's 40 um, different file types or submission types that can come in. Some of them are Excel, some of them are CSV, some of them are SQLs, like different file types, different formats. And our, our idea behind this was whatever it comes in as, we do a little bit of, I've called it specific Python um, in this little box in the middle. The specific Python code can run to convert that into data CSVs and metadata CSVs. And once it has those, it can do all the other processes that we've talked about. And this is the really nice part because we have Python we can do things like we can use pandas to read Excel files, and we can use all forms of different libraries that are designed to read different input files, no matter what they are, and then convert it. And that's something Snowflake couldn't do on its own. Right. It needs an extra push. Right. No, I think th this is this is really good um, example. Like I said, of you know, the, like you said, how you bring the leverage of the power of Python, right? in combination with the capabilities of Snowflake and, and, and bringing that perfect, you know, that, that marriage together of being able to, to make the two kind of kind of work together. Unfortunately, Chris, I think we are getting to the point where we're a little bit of out of time because we could definitely go on and on and on on, on this topic. Um, but where could people find a little bit more information on, on all of this? That's an excellent question. Uh, so the main places I would look really, uh, obviously Snowflake have a bunch of their own information out there that I can't help but recommend. Um, Snowflake Learn Academy and all that has plenty of stuff. But, you know, just to plug some of my own stuff quite selfishly, uh, <laughs> if you hop over to my LinkedIn, there's a, a featured window where I've got a few links to it as well. Um, but effectively, the Interworks blog, uh, I, I've announced a, or I've released a series of blogs on there um, going back several years now. Mainly, I have a Snowflake with Python series where I have uh, a list of what I've called the definitive guides for Snowflake and Snowpark. Those guides include right from the start how to create a session through to creating UDTFs, creating store procedures, using those to do fun things in Python, something fun things in Azure, 
um, that whole blog is still going. And both of the things I've talked about today, they're not yet on that blog because they're really recent. I didn't want to talk about things I'd already published. Um, both of those, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, but both of those I'm hoping to release probably multiple blogs about in the coming months. And those will all be in that same location. Um, not just talking about me, but then talking about other people again. Uh, I would also recommend uh, there is a, a session that I'm part of a panel for in Snowflake Summit. It's called Rapid Fire Use Cases and an Overview of Snowpark, a data super nice. Nice. So a bit of a worthy title, but I think it's well worth joining. It's only going to be about 20 minutes, so probably shorter than this session we've already had today. <laughs> yeah. But it's just a it is a, a rapid fire of people going through use cases they've talked about. Um, I'm going to mention the two things I've talked about here, but I'll probably only have about three or four minutes to talk about them instead of 20. So you'll find a whole load of different bits of information and different ideas that can hopefully spark some of your own innovation. Nice. Well, definitely lots of places and resources people can go to for everybody's knowledge. All the stuff that Chris just mentioned, we will have all the links in the comments below. So be sure to check them out. Connect with Chris on LinkedIn. But again, thanks for joining us today, Chris. It was it was a pleasure having you and, and very informative. And uh, we'll see you at Summit, actually. Cool. Cheers, Keith. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a good day.